Hello watch lovers, friends old and new, welcome back to the channel. My name is Stian and today we have a pretty cool watch on the bench. It's an Eternamatic fast beat. And yeah, they're not lying. That is fast beat all right. On the time grapher we see that the lines are straight, so that's uh, good to see. Apart from that, uh, hopefully the watch only needs the service. You see there's a hack that stops uh, the second's hand when you pull out uh, the hands to uh, set the time. That is very common nowadays, but uh, only started becoming common in the 1970s. On the crown you see the logo of Eterna, those five uh, balls. And uh, I think some of you probably know where that logo comes from, but uh, we'll look at that in a second as well. Let's use this uh, sticky bolt to uh, twist the case back off. Very useful. Doesn't leave any marks, of course. And there we have the movement. See the rotor is a little bit uh, loose. And if you look uh, closely at the rotor, you will see that it has uh, five small balls in the ball bearing. And obviously those five balls are uh, very similar to the ones uh, on the logo. So that's where they got the logo from. That is Eterna's uh, biggest uh, probably uh, claim to fame. That they introduced the ball bearings for the rotor instead of just uh, typical uh, post bearings. And those balls are tiny. We're talking a little bit more than half a millimeter per ball. So obviously those are not Norwegian. So uh, we took off this really nice dial. And uh, this movement is starting to look uh, more and more familiar. I'm not sure if anyone uh, sees any similarities. I have been talking about this a little bit before in other videos as well, but uh, there's a lot of ties internally in Switzerland. A lot of uh, names and uh, makers that have worked together here and there, and there's a lot of uh, history that sort of uh, crosses and meets again. And So I will talk a little bit about that in this uh, video as well. In general, it is a better idea to take uh, the rotor off sometimes also the automatic module off uh, while the watch uh, is in the case. But sometimes my uh, fingers do some things uh, my head uh, doesn't really control. And I guess I'm talking about watchmaking here. So I think it's getting more and more obvious that this movement really reminds us of something. That something being the uh, ETA 2824. And yes, this movement is pretty much a straight line uh, with uh, one more link between it to uh, the 2824. But you might have seen on the time grapher and on the dial as well that this is a 36,000 beats per hour uh, movement. We can also see that from uh, the balance spring that uh, it's very stiff, very rigid. So you can easily just turn it around without uh, worrying about the hairspring getting uh, distorted. So we saw that uh, the barrel arbor is a little bit uh, too... Uh, comfortable in the bearing. It's a little bit too much uh, shake there. So we're going to have to address that. We saw that uh, the rotor also was a little bit uh, loose, so we're going to address that as well. And apart from that, on uh, the train side, it's pretty much identical to the 2824. So why is that, you may ask? Yes, sit down, children, and I will tell you all about it. Yay, thanks, Grandpa. 
can we have candy after? Yeah, I think any kid uh, wanting to hear the story about the Terra and uh, Etta would uh, need quite a lot of candy to stay awake. And by the way, before I continue the story, I thought maybe I would uh, share that my wife actually caught me the other day. And no, I'm not talking about a trivial thing like uh, cheating on her or anything. No, she caught me making voices. I'm an idiot, so I sort of like to make voices when I'm by myself. And one of my uh, favorites, I suppose, uh, is kind of a maniacal uh, leprechaun. So I go like, oh, right then. Oh, right. Oh, right. <laughs> and my wife uh, caught me. And uh, trust me, the old shaggy advice, just say it wasn't you, didn't work. And I say sometimes it's better to uh, let people think you're a fool than open your mouth and confirm it. But uh, anyway, so uh, Eterna is actually one of the older manufacturers uh, in Switzerland, um, established in 1856. And uh, some of you might then think that, oh, but uh, Etta says established in 17 something, don't they? So how is that uh, related? Well, the thing is that um, there have been two major upheavals in the Swiss uh, watchmaking industry. One is, of course, the quartz crisis, as it's sometimes called. I covered that quite extensively in one of uh, my videos. The quartz crisis was in uh, many ways a uh, self-inflicted wound. But uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to retell that whole story. But um, the other one was in the late 1920s, in the early 1930s. And that's, of course, the Great Depression. And the Great Depression uh, had a big, bad impact on uh, basically all industry worldwide. And the uh, watchmaking industry was not uh, spared from that either. What it did was lead to a lot of consolidation in uh, Switzerland. So that's when you had these uh, sort of uh, holding companies or groups pop up, like uh, Aswag, SSIH, and so forth. And in that whole uh, turmoil, uh, Eterna then also decided to uh, basically split into two companies. One would be uh, still Eterna, still making watches, selling watches, and so forth. And the other would then be ETA, which would be uh, producing uh, movements for third parties. During story time, for those who are still awake, we managed to uh, strip the whole watch and put everything through the cleaner. We're also going to replace this uh, really uh, scratched uh, crystal. So taking that out of uh, the case. It's a mineral crystal uh, that it's uh, very commonly press fit into the gasket, as you see here. And even though mineral glass is pretty hard, it does scratch and chip and so forth. So we can see it's pretty badly damaged here. It's not uh, as hard as sapphire. But we have a nice uh, shiny new one that we're going to put in. Let's just first uh, put the case and uh, everything through the ultrasonic. All right, we got uh, the movement back from uh, the cleaning machine. First thing we're gonna do is put uh, some of the parts uh, into this uh, liquid called the Fixo Drop. And what Fixo Drop does is to uh, basically create a very thin uh, membrane on top of uh, the part uh, of a steric acid. And uh, what that does is to basically stop uh, lubricants from uh, creeping. Of course, uh, in a high bit movement like uh, this, uh, the parts that really move fast are uh, exactly the pallet fork uh, and the escape wheel, apart from the balance, of course. 
and then we can put a tiny little drop of uh, oil, light oil, onto uh, the capstones. What that does is to uh, really minimize the friction uh, that is generated between uh, the pivot end and uh, the jewel, which makes it oscillate more freely. Not a big fan of this uh, KIF uh, shock settings myself. I do prefer the Inca block. The Inca block chatons have uh, tiny little edges that make them easier to grip. And with that, we can put the shock settings back in, uh, inside the balance, both on top and bottom. Let's see if it oscillates. And yeah, that looks uh, just fine. Didn't uh, hit the balance with all the air, but uh, still uh, oscillates freely. So we can uh, turn to uh, the mainspring. The mainspring is the only source of power in the wristwatch, in a mechanical watch, rather. And it fits into this barrel here, as you saw when we took it out. I was uh, rambling on about something else at that point, but uh, maybe you just turn off the sound and uh, watch the actual content. Anyway, the mainspring uh, looks in good shape, so we're going to reuse it. Nice, Ben. Yeah, my son is growing so fast, he has to get new football shoes every uh, eight, nine months now. Anyway, uh, we're going to reuse the mainspring, so we put it into this uh, mainspring winder. The size is a little bit awkward uh, for some of these uh, movements, so I'm sort of combining uh, two uh, parts here that don't actually fit together, but that's to uh, make sure that uh, the mainspring doesn't uh, coil itself up, bungle up rather, inside uh, this uh, mainspring winder. There are specific uh, mainspring winders for uh, the most common ETA calibers. I rarely work on the most common ETA calibers, so I don't need those. So I'll uh, do this little trick instead. Works for me. Then we use this plunger to put uh, the mainspring into uh, the barrel. There we are. For the barrel arbor, the way I like to do it is to get that little hook uh, in first. Then it's easier to uh, sort of press the barrel arbor into place. Little uh, lubrication where we know that there's going to be some friction. Then we can put this nice golden lid back on and press everything uh, together. There we are. So we uh, remember that there was also a little bit of an issue with uh, the slack or the shake if you will, in the, the barrel uh, arbor bearing in the bridge. So we're going to have to uh, adjust that, which means it's time for some anger management. We can let all that pent up frustration just rain down on this uh, barrel bridge. So we're basically going to hit the barrel bridge from the bottom to the top and the bottom uh, with uh, two domed surfaces. And those two surfaces uh, cannot uh, fully meet, of course. If they do, then you wouldn't actually uh, hit uh, anything on the barrel bridge. So we see these are a little bit too small. So we're going to change that. Yeah, that one looks much better. Now we can bring out our weapon of mass destruction. And no, this hammer might not look so big. But if you zoom in, it looks much bigger. Yeah, take that. Get all that anger out, man. Yeah. So the goal is to make uh, the hole a little bit too small for uh, the barrel arbor. And then we use uh, this uh, smoothing brooch to open it up a little bit again. 
that also uh, compresses the metal around the hole so it becomes a little bit stronger as a bearing as well. And then uh, the slack should be uh, pretty much gone. There always needs to be a little tiny bit of play. That is uh, necessary because uh, the watch uh, does move and gets uh, subjected to sharks and that kind of thing. But uh, shouldn't be as much as it was, so it looks uh, better now. So uh, we talked quite a lot about uh, Eterna versus uh, Etta. But Eterna as a brand also has a rich uh, history. Perhaps their uh, best known model is the Contiki. Nowadays it comes in a lot of different versions. But the original uh, model was uh, worn by uh, explorers on the Contiki expedition back in uh, the 1940s. Essentially this uh, crazy Norwegian called uh, Thor Heyerdahl or Thor Heyerdahl, was on his honeymoon uh, in the Easter Islands. And there are some pretty famous uh, sculptures and artifacts there, and uh, the locals said uh, it stemmed from uh, Asian cultures. But uh, this guy got it in his head that uh, he had seen something similar in uh, South America. So, uh, of course, he did what any uh, self-respecting Norwegian would do. He stepped on a raft in South Africa and just let the raft take him wherever it wanted for a hundred days. So the whole goal was to prove that uh, the currents actually brought people from civilizations in South America to uh, those islands. And uh, yes, they proved that it actually uh, was a sound theory. And another thing that also proved itself was then the watches they wore, the uh, Eterna Contiki. Imagine being on a 10 by 5 meter raft for 101 days in the middle of the ocean. That's a pretty good test for uh, how uh, water resistant uh, the watch is and how it uh, copes with all those things. Most of the models also have a medallion on the back with this uh, Contiki raft uh, engraved in them. And if you're so inclined, you can even see the original raft in a museum in uh, Oslo in Norway. Pretty small raft for uh, 101 days with a crew of, I think it was seven or eight people. Anyway, we started uh, putting the Achilles works back together. This is probably where the movement uh, differs the most from uh, the 28-24. You'll sort of recognize some of the parts, but the overall layout is a little bit different. The turn of 1541 was the direct predecessor for the 2824. And uh, the 1541 uh, built quite a bit on uh, this one. And there were some uh, other movements as well. The 1504 is basically the forerunner for the 2892. So when you work on these old movements, you will see a lot of uh, familial uh, ties. That's uh, pretty cool to see. So just like the 2824, there's no uh, friction fit cannon pinion uh, in this movement. It has almost the same uh, friction set as the 2824. So we put a little bit of uh, thick oil in there and then we have to make sure that it rotates uh, freely. So one question I'm sure quite a few people have is um, Given that this one was a forerunner to the 2824, why wasn't the 2824 also 36,000 BPH? Well, first of all, the uh, 1541, that was uh, the actual 2824 forerunner, uh, was also 28,800. And uh, my theory is that uh, there is relatively little uh, difference between the 28800 and 36000 in terms of uh, the feel of the watch. The sweep second sand is still very smooth on the 28800. And I don't really buy that there's a lot of uh, difficulties or complexities uh, by the extra higher beat rate. 
I think it's mostly a marketing thing that uh, given that most watch owners don't service their watches as frequent as they should, you would get a lot of bad publicity if a 36,000 BPH watch uh, would stop working or start running erratically. Because there is a higher chance that uh, the lubrication will uh, creep or be uh, flung off, basically. But that's just uh, my opinion. If anyone uh, has some factual information from the manufacturers, for instance, Longines, the Ultra Cron growing from uh, 36,000 to 28,800, this one the same. So it'd be very interesting to hear if anyone has any inside actual uh, facts about this. Another little uh, thing about the Eterna watches that comes up is, uh, of course, this whole Eternamatic uh, thing. So the name of the brand is actually Eterna, the manufacturer, and they use Eternamatic for all their automatic watches with this ball bearing uh, rotor. So it's not a brand per se, but it's something uh, they've used in marketing uh, ever since they introduced the uh, ball bearing uh, router back in uh, 1948. All right, with the pallet fork in place, we can give a little wind on the movement and then we can put uh, some grease on the pallet stones. What we do is put uh, the grease on uh, the exit pallet stone and then we move the pallet fork from side to side so that uh, the teeth of the escape wheel on the left here can uh, scrape across the surface of the pallet stone and thus uh, take some oil with them so that each tooth gets a little bit of uh, oil or grease rather and that helps uh, the friction uh, be kept to a minimum. And yes, these things are small. The pallet stone, the whole length of it is uh, about a millimeter, I suppose. Maybe one and a half. So with the uh, pallets lubricated, we can uh, put the balance back in. And see if this uh, baby wants to start running. All right, looks good. Then let's uh, oil the different uh, pivot holes. That is, of course, again, to uh, reduce friction. There's so little power in the wristwatch. So uh, we need to reduce friction wherever we can, basically. All right, then we're ready for the time grapher. Let's just uh, demagnetize the watch first. Magnetization is a bit of an issue with watches, especially older ones where there are more parts than can be magnetized. A magnetized watch will uh, run erratically. Can run too slow, but uh, very often way too fast. And the reason is that uh, the hairspring uh, coils might actually stick together. All right, looks uh, pretty okay. We just uh, have to adjust the rate a little bit. See, the amplitude is uh, relatively low, but that's not uncommon for these uh, high bit watches. And with the automatic module in place, it should also be a little bit higher, so that's uh, okay. We'll leave it at that. Then what we need to do is put in uh, the complications. And this one then has two complications. It's the uh, automatic uh, works. Quite straightforward, uh, very uh, similar, of course, to uh, 2824. 
when it's ready. And then the other uh, complication is the date. Quite straightforward. And also a lot of things that remind us of uh, the 2024. One thing that's uh, worth noting is that um, this movement does not have those uh, stamped out parts that uh, the 2824 has. We have this uh, stamped out uh, cover both uh, here for the intermediate uh, date setting wheel and also uh, over the keyless works. Very flaky thin pieces of uh, sheet metal. This feels a little bit sturdier. All right, the date uh, seems to work fine. Then we can put on uh, the arrow wheel. We're also going to just uh, check that the date uh, flips over when you uh, turn the hands through 24 hours as well. Kind of important. All right. Also going to put a little bit of oil on uh, the date jumper and then we're going to run it through all the different uh, dates so we can uh, distribute the oil a little bit and with that we can put this uh, really cool dial back on kind of has this uh, natural stone look it isn't stone but uh, kind of has that uh, look and feel I think it's very cool. For the hands then, we uh, made sure that we found midnight by uh, moving uh, the crown. So the date just flips over. Now we can put uh, the hour hand at midnight at that point. And then just test that we uh, found it pretty well. I want to say pretty well. It should be within uh, plus minus 15 minutes of uh, midnight. And we should be able to get it within five minutes typically. Kind of sounded like uh, sound effects, but it was actually uh, just uh, some stones being thrown in the container outside. The hands are in really nice condition as uh, the whole dial is. But there are some smudge marks on it, so we're just uh, taking some rubber coat to remove it. Yeah, that looks good. And let's put on the second sand as well, and uh, then we can uh, case the movement. So I've been uh, saying 36,000 BPH and 28,800 and those types of things. And uh, to a lot of viewers, maybe that's like just some random numbers. What it actually means is that uh, 36,000, as we see on the dial here, it's uh, basically 36,000 ticks and talks every minute. And if you do the math, you'll see that means uh, 10 ticks and talks every second. And the result of that is that you get this very smooth movement of the second set. So if we slow it down a little bit, 
You see it moves very small increment. And it does that then very frequently, which then ultimately makes it seem very, very smooth. All right, we are ready to case the movement. The case itself uh, has never been polished. We still see the original uh, finishing in uh, good condition. And most vintage uh, watch lovers will tell you that uh, they would prefer a uh, case to be original. Yes, it's a 50 uh, odd year old watch, so it will have some marks, but that's kind of part of the package uh, when you like uh, vintage watches. But of course, some people would prefer their watches to look brand new regardless. But when you have uh, a sunburst pattern on the case, uh, like you have here, it's very complicated to uh, refinish that to the same exact finish. The risk of uh, making it look uh, different or not good is very high. All right, with the automatic module in place, just put a tiny little bit of oil in the last uh, few pivot holes. Before we put in the rotor, we might remember that uh, there was a little bit uh, too much uh, slack in the rotor as well. If uh, the slack is not too bad, then we can uh, try to uh, basically squeeze the ball bearing a little bit tighter uh, together. Like we're doing here. Ultimately, if the slack is too high, you of course need to uh, simply change the ball bearing. There will always be a little bit of slack in the rotor, and there should be as well, so it can absorb uh, shocks. And that little cutout you see in the rotor is also uh, meant to uh, facilitate uh, shock uh, absorption. But sometimes you can even hear the rotor hit the back of the case, and that's a really bad sign that uh, the slack is way too much. And then you would also see uh, scraping or wear marks on the rotor typically. All right, last thing before we uh, put the case back on and uh, a strap. I'm putting in a new gasket to try to keep the watch at least uh, as water resistant as uh, we can. These old watches uh, have been a little bit too uh, much beaten up to really be uh, very water resistant anymore. The crown is uh, typically the biggest culprit for that, but um, there are very small tolerances when you uh, put these uh, parts together. And over the decades, those tolerances grow, and hence the water resistance uh, is diminished. All right, the watch is uh, ready to wear. It's a big, chunky watch and with a new crystal and a beautiful dial. I think it looks really cool on the wrist. That super smooth second sand is uh, always a joy to uh, look at. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then clicking uh, like and subscribe will really help the channel. We'll be back with another video shortly. Until then, ta-ta. <laughs>